I found myself in New York City at Sotheby's Auction House, a place that I'd heard about but never visited. It's a very upscale building with a doorman out front, a small tea house and cafe, and even a Sotheby's branded wine cellar accessible from the lobby. I was there because there was a showing of an estate, the estate of the magician Ricky Jay, and I wanted to see what it would feel like to walk through the final act of a very impressive life. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Eric Vitello, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Ricky Jay was a master magician. I'd be doing him a disservice trying to summarize his career. But over the years, he became known not just for his off-Broadway productions, but his acting in television and movies. But most importantly, he became not just a master magician, but a master historian and researcher of magic and all of the different ways that we present the odd to each other. His collection, over time, ranged from one-of-a-kind documents and drawings all the way through to magic lanterns, slides, and room-sized posters advertising all manner of showmanship, magic, freak shows, circuses, and attention-grabbing versions of technical demonstrations. Before I go any further, let me recommend his book, Learned Pigs and Fireproof Women, which is like a waterfall of facts and references, all different ways that magicians and show people made their way through society, gaining attention, filling people with wonder, and being, in every single way, unbelievably interesting. Living as he did in this duality, really a triality, of existence, where his magic shows were not just masterful showings of card tricks and illusions, Mr. J made it a personal crusade to find out all of the buried stories of show people throughout the centuries. I never got to meet him, but I feel like I knew where he was coming from. From when he was a child, he had taken an interest in magic, such that he had become known in his teenage years for doing magic shows. And of course, as time went on, he perfected his act, making himself into a sultan of card mastery. Ricky Jay and his 52 assistants, providing people with what seemed like impossible leaps of faith, turning simply knowing what card you held to a whole other level. And what happened after that catapulted him from just being someone who could give you a good show or make a good appearance on a late night talk program. Ricky Jay started to research not just magic, but the nature of magic. The idea of what makes us so incredibly compelled by watching somebody do something which we know is impossible. Know that the current rules of physics cannot allow, even through our suspension of disbelief or lack of it thereof. Over the years, Mr. J would do incredible amounts of research into people who lived once as infamous figures but who were rapidly fading, buying up rare broadsheets and papers about these acts and then tracking them all the way through their life, from main act to sideshow to occasionally appearing to maybe disappearing without a trace or dying at a very early age from injuries or diseases related to the work they did. Magic, he once said, was the art of knowing that you could never believe the amount of preparation that went into what's being done right now. I have fundamentally taken that definition to heart. The work I do, the best work that I do, is work where it seems nobody would be able to achieve it if it's not for the hundreds of hours required to get us to the point where we are now. A disbelief that anybody would be dedicated to their craft, to work that hard for what seems like something so simple or so little. But that is the fundamental drive that brings together a lot of archiving, 
a lot of work presenting people with something that just works. Sotheby's had dedicated almost an entire floor to the items that they were putting up for auction from Ricky Jay's estate. A newspaper article that I read about the whole auction said that this was just a fraction of items he had. It was clear, walking through these hallways and these different display cases, that Sotheby's had focused on one very specific subset of materials. Papers. Not just papers, of course. Books, broadsheets, posters, flat items whose age could be determined, whose authenticity could be verified, which they could then provide for sale for a very clearly defined amount of money. I wasn't so much interested in the prices this would fetch. Auctions, of course, are designed to wrap you up in the emotion of the moment, being told a story about an item and then encouraging you to go a little farther, to stretch a little more with what you thought you were going to spend, until looking back, breathless, you see that you have a number many figures higher than you thought you were going to spend. Obviously, online auctions try to give you a little bit of this feeling but very little compares to a room full of breathless people listening to an auctioneer asking for one more number, one more bid, driving things along until finally somebody has spent $50,000 on something that you probably thought would go for five. That's the magic of the auction show, something I completely reject. Acquisition and processing and understanding all of these items that life provides us is hard enough work for me as it is. I'm not really into the whole selling it afterwards thing. Obviously, his family had decided that many of these pieces should be brought to the public and sold. And what Sotheby's had chosen were the most commodified ones, the posters that were guaranteed to be a hundred years old and contain a lot of beautiful art on them, or books that had a specific age, putting them at 200 or 300 years, enabling them to put a bibliophile's price on these objects. But the context, the meaning by which all of these items were put together, that was lost. The magician who had put together the spell of this collection was gone. His words disappeared. This collection, hung as it was with an introduction from contemporaries of Ricky Jay and almost arranged as if it was a real museum, was inspiring. Ricky Jay had impeccable taste about different items and their beauty. They had been preserved beautifully. It was a pleasure to wear my top hat, walk along this beautiful display, and try to forget the cold hard fact. This was not a museum. This was an estate sale, a classy one, to be sure, presented in the tones of reverence that it deserved. But it was still an estate sale. This conflagration, this chosen library, was going to split apart, break down, go into different directions, never to be seen together again. How many years they lived under Ricky Jay's roof, how many times he pulled out a specific paper to show to a guest and impress them with the story of what this paper represented, I'll never know. But it brings me to mind the nature of all these objects that people collect. When we put together a whole range of objects, physical or digital, they represent not a permanent monolith built in the desert, seen by countless generations and discovered for thousands of years hence. They represent a moment in time, a time when a personal spirit or the spirit and meaning of a group allowed all of these objects to live together for whatever time they do. In the digital world, these hallways of displayed items live a little shorter on average, than buildings full of file cabinets and archive quality boxes. But they represent the same situation, an understanding that life, no matter how much we wish to act differently, is temporary at best. Sometimes the lights for the end of the show go down quietly and obviously, giving us time to say goodbye and our bows. 
But so many other times, the house lights come up immediately, telling the audience the show is definitively over, halfway through a sentence, halfway through an act, and we're never going to get that resolution. Standing as I was in a temporary collection of a temporary collection of the works and the research and the life of Ricky Jay, I realized the greatest trick of all was fooling ourselves into thinking permanent is a real thing. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Peter Healy, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Matt Reynolds, Sean Kelly, John Sturm, Manxalot, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. For the second time, I will tell you Learned Pigs and Fireproof Women by Ricky Jay is one of the most delightful books I've ever read. It is not a story. It's barely a history. What it really is, is a combination of knowledge, memories, and a magician, Ricky Jay himself, walking you through these corridors, letting you know that this sort of life, this life of being a performer, of being a trickster, a person providing horror and insight and attention and wonder to folks, goes very deep in every direction and may he concludes, be a fundamental part of the human experience. Abra Cadabra.